Well, good morning, happy Monday, and happy New Year to everybody. I hope you had a safe and enjoyable New Year's Eve, and I hope that your new year has gotten off to a safe and enjoyable start. As for my family and me, we spent the majority of New Year's Day on the couch, uh, not because we weren't feeling well, uh, but because it was New Year's Day football. And of course, it all led up to the big game in the evening where Ohio State played Clemson. Uh, we lost to them in a very difficult and frustrating football game last year. Uh, but this year, we redeemed ourselves. We beat Clemson, and we're going to the national championship. So it's been a wonderful New Year's uh, for us so far. Of course, one week from today, we have to play Alabama. And so our feelings of excitement and euphoria may come to an abrupt end. But then again, maybe, just maybe, Ohio State can pull off one more football victory. We'll have to see. Well, today we want to dive back into the Gospel of Mark. And today we're going to do things maybe in a slightly reverse way from what you often do. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of implications of the text that I'm going to ask you to read today. And then after you've watched this video, I'm going to ask you to read it for yourselves with these implications in mind. So our passage for today is Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. When we talk about this passage, we often refer to it as the transfiguration. About a week after Jesus uh, was with his disciples in Caesarea Philippi, when he asked the disciples, who do the people say that I am? And then he turns the question on them and he says, what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter gives this great confession. You are the Messiah. About a week after that, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John on top of a mountain and in this mountain, his, his appearance is transformed, uh, where they see this brilliant white Jesus, where he is displaying his glory. Well, it's a significant passage for at least three reasons, because it tells us at least three things about Jesus. The first thing that it reveals is that suffering leads to glory. Here's where it's important that we read the transfiguration in the context of the Gospel of Mark. And remember where we were at the end of last week. Uh, Peter makes this wonderful confession that Jesus is the Messiah. But then Jesus goes on to explain what kind of Messiah he is. And as Jesus explains himself, he says the Son of Man must suffer, die and then rise again. And this is what was so difficult for the disciples to comprehend. When they thought of a Messiah, they did not think of a suffering Messiah. They did not think of a Messiah who would experience defeat, uh, who the forces of evil, even the forces of death, would seemingly win, at least for a couple of days. But Jesus says that as a Messiah, he must die. This is his destiny. This is his path through which he will offer salvation to everyone who believes in him. It is through his suffering and his death and ultimately his resurrection. But I think when we read these passages back to back with Jesus explaining that he must suffer and die, and then that leads to the transfiguration where the disciples see his glory it reveals an important part of Jesus, that suffering leads to glory, that it is suffering that leads to salvation. It is his suffering that leads him to accomplish the purposes that he came to earth to accomplish. So often we want to jump to the glory. Uh, we want to jump to the rewards. We want to jump to the victory. But the victory comes through suffering. And that's so important for us to remember. A second thing that this teaches us about Jesus is Jesus' relationship to Moses and Elijah. As Peter, James, and John are up there on that mountain, for a while there, they see two figures along with Jesus. It's Moses and Elijah. And Moses and Elijah represent the Old Testament law and the Old Testament prophets. They were the ones that the disciples listened to before Jesus. They were the primary spokespeople for God. You want to know what God wanted for you? You read Moses. You want to know how to interpret Moses? You read the prophets. But what is revealed on this mountain 
is that Jesus is superior to Moses and Elijah. Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets. Uh, the authoritative path through God, God's authoritative revelation of himself, God's authoritative word no longer comes through Moses and Elijah. It comes through Jesus. If we want to know what God is like, we look to Jesus. If we want to know what God wants for our lives, we look to Jesus. There's this moment in the passage where Moses and Elijah are there, but a voice comes from heaven, from God the Father, to, to referring to Jesus, saying, listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Follow Jesus. Follow his words. Follow his example. My will is now revealed in him. So the second thing is that shows that Jesus fulfills and supersedes the law and the prophets he is now the perfect and the authoritative and the ultimate revelation of God and God's will. There's a third and a final thing that I'll mention in this moment, and that is that Peter, James, and John have the privilege of standing in the midst of God's glory without consequence. It takes us back to Exodus. And you remember when Moses is on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments and he asks a question of God. He says, God, I want to receive you. I want to see you in your glory. And God says, you can't see me in my glory. Nobody can see me in my glory and live because my glory is perfect holiness and, and you are stained with sin. Uh, but God accommodates Moses in a way and says, Moses, you, you hide in the rock. And then when I passed by, you'll just be able to catch the smallest glimpse of my glory. And that was a gift to Moses. But here, Peter, James, and John are standing in the midst of God's glory without consequence. Why? Because they are standing in the midst of God's glory with Jesus. They have trusted Jesus. They have placed their faith in Jesus. And because of that, they can stand in the midst of God's glory, in the midst of God's holiness. More than that, God welcomes them and invites them. And that's only possible because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. There's a lot going on in this passage, a lot going on in Mark 9, 1 to 13, that tells us a lot about Jesus. So this video is over. I encourage you to open up the Gospel of Mark, read 9, 1 through 13, and really ponder and consider all the wonderful things that are being revealed at this moment. Have a great day.